The Marvel vs. Capcom series of games is absolutely insane. Whenever I revisit these, I can't help but feel the surge of excitement that coursed through my veins the first time I saw many of these classic titles. The clash of iconic characters from the Marvel Universe in Capcom's gaming pantheon has been nothing short of legendary. The pixelated sprites of Spider-Man swinging alongside Ryu's Hadouken or Wolverine unleashing his Admantian claws against the likes of Mega Man produces a salivating symphony of crossover chaos. The frantic battles, the over-the-top special moves and the exhilarating tag team mechanics defined an era of competitive gaming. So with that said, join me today as we take the deepest of deep dives as we leave no stone unturned and look back at all of these iconic offerings. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. This is a new and up-to-date movie length look at the entire Marvel vs Capcom dynasty. Yeah! Like with many games discussing fighting game history, a great starting point is always with the release of Street Fighter 2, the game credited for rejuvenating the arcade market in a period where people spent most of their gaming time on consoles at home. With Street Fighter 2's success, Capcom decided they wanted to milk the game for all it was worth, which would soon lead to countless revisions, with each iteration being arguably more polished than the last. Despite relying on this formula for at least a few years, Capcom knew that to captivate the Street Fighter audience, sooner or later the fans would need something new, which would eventually lead to the arcade release of Street Fighter Alpha in 1995. But for reasons, this was not enough for Capcom, as over the next 12 months following the birth of Alpha, the arcades would bloody see the release of another four fighting games featuring the Street Fighter license. 1996-1997 would be a hectic period for the franchise, as it would see the debut of Street Fighter Alpha 2, Street Fighter 3, Street Fighter EX and the subject of today's video, X-Men vs Street Fighter. That is a freaking lot of Street Fighters for such a short time frame, right? This makes it no surprise that the casual audience severely struggled to keep up and stay interested in the standard Street Fighter brand, as there was more games than any casual cared to keep up with. So, for most people, out of the games released in this era, X-Men vs Street Fighter was certainly the most interesting of the bunch, with myself being one of the individuals who was thoroughly fascinated by this concept, as pairing up the X-Men and Street Fighter together seemed like such a strange yet perfect idea. On the X-Men side of things, the superheroes were in a very different place in 1996 to their standing today. Originally debuting in 1963 as a comic book series by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, by the time we got to the 90s the franchise had entered all sorts of entertainment mediums. A focal point in the expansion of the brand occurred on the 12th of February 1992, the day an awesome X-Men beat-em-up was released into the arcade by Konami. Apparently, the character designs in this one will be based on the 1989 X-Men cartoon pilot episode, known as Pride of the X-Men, and this high-quality experience is remembered extremely fondly today as the first ever top-tier X-Men video game. I mean, come on, it was six-player, for crying out loud. Later that very year, an X-Men animated series would debut on the Fox Kids Network and become equally critically acclaimed, and more importantly, a huge commercial success. As a result, this would spawn another four seasons of the show, more comic books, action figures and of course even more video games. We have now looked at loads of these on the channel already, but unfortunately most from this period weren't great due to a claim holding the licensing rights to publish most X-Men games. You know, that greedy company who would often churn out utter rubbish under the LJM brand. Sadly, there were no Konami X-Men games that could be enjoyed in the homes. Fortunately, through this era of bad to mediocre Marvel games, at some point Capcom would manage to strike up a licensing deal with a company, first working on the Punisher arcade game. The Punisher would deliver brilliance, instilling enough confidence in Marvel to work with Capcom further. Moving on to the next Capcom Marvel project, we would get the 1994 title, X-Men Children of the Atom. This was initially released on the Capcom CP System 2 arcade hardware, before being released on several home platforms too. The fighting game features controls and conventions that Capcom previously established within Street Fighter 2 and Darkstalkers, but would include one key massive innovation, the introduction of superhero-like air combat. As expected, this would result in a chaotic, exciting fighting game indeed, but the title would also include one more feature functioning as a cherry on top, 
Basically, part of a licensing agreement struck by Capcom allowed them to place Akuma as a secret character within the game. This fighter, who was inspired by the legend of Shen Long, was appearing in multiple Street Fighter games as a secret, unlockable, playable character and opponent. Inserting him straight into the X-Men universe would be even more magical, a beat the ridiculously out of place looking Street Fighter 2 sprite. This would of course mark the first time in which characters from X-Men and Street Fighter would face off against each other, but as we know, it would be far from the last time. The following year of 1995 would see the next Capcom Marvel game, a video game simply titled Marvel Super Heroes. This would be a similar fighting game, with it this time featuring a whole range of characters from across the Marvel Universe, as opposed to just X-Men. The game included needing to collect infinity gems from your opponents, with a final boss encounter against Thanos. But it would be the next Capcom Marvel fighting game where things got really interesting, so let's watch the game's arcade attract screen. <laughs> X-Men versus Street Fighter! How could you possibly have watched the VAT in 1996 without getting extremely excited to play this one? This title was insane. The epic opening scene touts itself as the wildest crossover you have ever dreamt of, which would be perfectly applicable if you hadn't already been dreaming about it two years after playing Children of the Atom. For those who have experienced this now classic game for the Capcom CP System 2 hardware, this title's player select screen gives gamers a choice of 16 different playable characters, either from the world of X-Men or of course Street Fighter. Most of the Street Fighter sprites are taken straight from the Alpha series, whereas the X-Men were mostly taken from Children of the Atom. The freshly drawn playable characters for this one include Rogue, Sabretooth and Gambit, since they were never featured in any Capcom games prior. Oh yeah, and the Kami sprite is new too, but she also appeared in Street Fighter Alpha 2 Gold around the same time. Once again regarding the characters, Akuma also returns as a secret character within the game, a fun little recurring trope. On top of that, the rest of the cast of the game also features the final boss battle against Apocalypse, which is a nice change of pace for many Capcom fighters of the time. Bearing in mind he is not a regular fighter and instead is massive and takes up the majority of the screen. He is more like certain boss encounters in a Mega Man X game or something. Like Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter Alpha and Capcom's previous Marvel games, this one was obviously yet another 2D fighting game. But the game varies from all of its predecessors due to it featuring dual character selection and tag team matches. Players, holla holla holla! The game further differs from many fighters in that the best of three rounds format is completely ditched. And instead, the fighting in this entry consists of just single rounds. Going back to that lovely player select screen I mentioned earlier, the player must choose two of these players prior to a playthrough. As a result, the starting character can tag in and out of a fight with their off-screen character at will, changing the dynamic of this one completely when compared with previous Capcom offerings beyond the super cool crossover format. Regarding this mechanic, both controllable characters sport independent life gauges, and the dormant off-screen character will even regenerate HP when not in battle. If one of your characters is knocked out, the other jumps straight into play, letting the match continue until a team is defeated. All in all, making this Teddy Long's all-time favourite fighting game. All that was missing was going one-on-one -on -one with The Undertaker, but at least we had Apocalypse. Other mechanics also returned from previous Capcom Marvel games, including the amazing air combat first established in Children of the Atom. Through this, fighters can perform super jumps, allowing them to jump higher than normal and perform aerial raves, which enable combos in the air. Excellent. Regarding some of the big moves in this game, many are quite frankly ridiculous and are very fitting of the X-Men. When it comes to the Street Fighters, on the other hand, certain maneuvers did look a bit out of place. For example, Ryu can suddenly perform a massive Kamehameha beam, instead of just a simple Hadouken. But then again, without such manoeuvres, how else would these lot compete with Marvel characters, I guess? After hitting arcades in Japan in late 1996, the game would go into circulation worldwide shortly after. 
According to Electronic Gaming Monthly, surprisingly, the game was only mildly popular when first released on US soil, but after a few months, it reportedly began to pick up some steam due to word of mouth spreading regarding this one's coolness. Regarding how journalists responded to this title at the time, opinions were mixed, with the main consensus being that the game was a decent fighter, but just one of many to exist. Next Generation, for example, praised the new tag team mechanic, inflated projectile attacks and lengthy combos. However, they took note of how much Capcom will milk in the fighting game formula. So they concluded, X-Men vs Street Fighter is a fun game, but it's a bit of an overdose of the kind of game of which we've already played way too much. Despite these ramblings of negativity from journalists, the arcade version is very clearly fondly remembered today with, for me and many, the main drawing factor being the novelty of having Street Fighters and the X-Men characters in the same bloody game. Then again, the tag action was certainly something fresh and bombastic too, especially when we take into account that all of this occurred in an era where corporate crossovers seemed to happen far more infrequently. We still had no Smash Brothers yet, for example. Touching back on this game's gameplay, originally each character had at least one infinite combo, which was not actually an intended feature. The game-breaking ability to perform such crazy feats ended up existing in the original iteration of the game due to insufficient beta testing. As a result, Capcom would quietly tinker with X-Men vs Street Fighter resulting in two updated versions, colloquially known as version 2 and version 3. The main change in version 2 of the game is that it removed Ryu and Akuma's ability to recover from their hop kicks in midair. Version 2 also changed Ryu's Hurricane Super move to move the player up instead of down. Finally, Sabretooth and Dow Sims mechanics were altered as well. Version 3 of the game would see a more extensive overhaul though, resulting in Capcom removing all of the infinite combos that they knew of. Around this era of fighting game history, there were infamously no way to port Street Fighter 3 New Generation to home consoles, due to no home machines being available on the market in 1997 that could handle the extreme amount of 2D animation frames that were present in the game. This meant that for now at least the game was imprisoned on Capcom's technologically advanced Capcom CP System 3 arcade hardware. But fortunately for X-Men vs Street Fighter, the game wasn't quite as taxing. As already covered, this was a CP System 2 game which featured many assets that were simply recycled from Children of the Atom and Street Fighter Alpha 2, two games that had already been wonderfully ported to the Sega Saturn already. Keeping such thoughts in mind, on the 6th of November 1996 at a press conference, Capcom announced that the home version of X-Men vs Street Fighter would be a Sega Saturn exclusive. Now, when we consider that the Sega Saturn was never a particularly popular console outside of Japan, this would of course result in outrage, particularly amongst those who had become Sony PlayStation loyalists. The backlash from this announcement led to both the gaming press and fans alike accusing Capcom of demonstrating favoritism towards Sega, essentially making accusations that Sega and Capcom were colluding with each other to ensure that the Saturn had games that the PlayStation didn't. This conspiracy theory was further bolstered by the fact that Darkstalker's Revenge was also a Saturn exclusive and that Street Fighter Alpha 2 did not run as well on the PlayStation as it did the Sega Saturn. Gaming historians, though, will now easily be able to point to the reality that Street Fighter Alpha 2 ran better on the Saturn simply due to the Saturn being engineered better when it came to handling sprite-based games. The RAM cartridges that could be inserted into the top of the devices only improved the Saturn's capabilities in such an area too. Retrospectively, rather obviously, the early decision to make X-Men vs Street Fighter a Saturn home exclusive had nothing to do with favouritism and was simply related to the Sega Saturn's 2D capabilities. The Saturn was a superior system to the PlayStation in that regard, as it offered 50% more video memory, which in turn meant that the system could produce bigger and better sprites, along with superior looking backgrounds. The Saturn's two video processors could handle 2D beautifully, and that is even without the RAM cartridges. So all this meant that the Saturn would be the perfect home hardware for X-Men vs Street Fighter, a game which was more demanding to run than the Alpha series due to its tag team matches. So all in all, the decision to make the game a Saturn exclusive seemed like a very sensible choice. Unfortunately, a big stumbling block with this plan was coming to light, as during development the popularity of the Sega Saturn in the West continued to diminish, with the Sony PlayStation outpacing it more and more sales-wise every day. The Sony PlayStation's superior marketing, cheaper price point and heavy emphasis on polygon gaming made the hardware the average gamer's choice that generation, 
So with pressure continuing to mount from Capcom's Western fanbase, Capcom were backed into a corner and would be forced to rescind the idea of X-Men vs Street Fighter being Assassin exclusive. For now at least, fans were no longer outraged. As this was unfolding before our eyes, Electronic Gaming Monthly reported that Capcom had announced that instead of making the game a Sega exclusive, the game would have PlayStation and Saturn versions of X-Men vs Street Fighter with both being released simultaneously and both being arcade perfect. A bold claim indeed, which certainly couldn't go wrong, right? 14 months on from the game's arcade release, X-Men vs Street Fighter would arrive on the Saturn in November of 1997, but sadly, exclusively in Japan, with the PlayStation version nowhere to be seen. The game would be released to rave reviews and see a critical response even stronger than the original arcade release. This conversion of the game would be heavily praised for its fast-paced gameplay, great animations, sound quality and technical performance compared to its arcade counterpart. Gamesblock was in love with the game and stated that there is no better looking 2D fighter on any console system. Game Informer added to the praise of the port for running and looking identical to its arcade counterpart and declaring it one of the best arcade conversions ever seen to date. Next Generation 2 highly regarded this version stating that if nothing else, X-Men vs Street Fighter proved the old adage, more is better. The game ran arcade perfect on Saturn hardware, which was made possible due to the system's 2D capabilities paired with the adage of the Capcom 4 megabit RAM cartridge that came with the game. The Capcom cartridge was a system expansion cart that proceeded the 1 megabit RAM cartridge that had been released by SNK earlier for the system. This extra memory would assist the game's ability to run properly and prevent problems such as slowdown from happening. When you consider the existence of this expansion cartridge, it becomes even clearer why at one point Capcom wanted to release this game exclusively for the Saturn. Speaking of the Saturn version, sadly it would remain exclusive to Japan due to Sega's continuous reduction of support for the system in North America and Europe due to a lack of hardware and software sales. This however did not stop western game stores such as Electronic Boutique from importing the game from Japan and selling it to consumers regardless. The Sega Saturn remains a popular system with importers up until today and games like X-Men vs Street Fighter encouraged this trend in behaviour. So now we have talked about the Saturn version of the game, we need to move on to talk about the Sony PlayStation version and this is where things begin to get really juicy or should I say outrageous. Remember that arcade perfect PlayStation version of a game which Capcom promised to release the same day as the Saturn game? Well, that didn't happen, which should have sent alarm bells ringing instantly. Despite delays, the game would eventually be released on the PlayStation in Japan, but not until February 1998. This was four months after the Saturn version. It would not get to America till June and Europe and Australia until the winter. Staggered regional releases were nothing out of the ordinary at the time, but the fact that the PlayStation version was left cooking for longer raised a lot of questions, particularly when we take into account that originally Capcom didn't want to make a PlayStation version at all. After buckling to pressure and releasing a PlayStation version of X-Men vs Street Fighter, the game would not be the arcade perfect conversion that the company had once promised, as those with technical know-how had already foreseen. They won't remember. The PlayStation port of the game was vastly inferior to its Saturn counterpart. The system's memory limitations and other 2D weaknesses required X-Men vs Street Fighter to be massively scaled down and altered in both the areas of gameplay and graphics. This would include Capcom needing to remove several character animation frames from the game to get the game to run on puny PlayStation hardware. Whilst all of this was key to getting the game working on the device, the most notable and shocking omission from this version was the removal of tag team combat, a staple of the game and a mechanic that was one of the biggest features that had made the game stand out from the pack. In this watered down iteration, the second character is only used during specific attacks such as the variable combinations. The ability to switch between characters at will is completely gone. To compensate for this tag change, one round battles are changed to the regular 2 out of 3 full encounters found in most other generic fighting games from the period. Interestingly, as a compensatory offering, a stage match can still be experienced in the game, however only using a cheat code. I say only a sort of tag match because to make this possible, 
both you and your opponent have to play as the same two characters due to the PlayStation's lack of ability to keep four different character animations in its working memory simultaneously. The gimped PlayStation version of X-Men vs Street Fighter would result in some absolutely hilarious reviews at the time, with many journalists completely chastising this version of the game. The game that people were outraged about not being made was now causing outrage due to being made. Sometimes there's no pleasing people. Next Generation, for example, who we have touched on several times in this video, stated, If you've never seen a Capcom fighting game before, this might be fun for a few minutes. But there is not one single positive thing to be said for the trade-offs that Capcom made to get this game to the PlayStation. Ouch. Game Revolution adds to this version's criticism by stating, The game is a poor conversion of its arcade counterpart. The graphics aren't going to impress anyone, either. If you're looking for a game that is a better arcade translation, check out Tekken 3 or wait for Street Fighter vs Care Bears, due out later this year. My favourite of these angry reviews came from GameSpot, which is hilarious to read throughout. The opening paragraph of this review features a level of salt that is so intense that it had me chuckling upon digesting every sentence. The opening paragraph reads, When a system is incapable of doing justice to a game, one would think a company would be smart enough to not release the game on that system. But for reasons that are probably based entirely around making money, Capcom has released a completely butchered version of its arcade fighter, X-Men vs Street Fighter, on the PlayStation. Amongst this scathing review, they also state that The graphics look very washed out and there is a completely unacceptable amount of slowdown. Ken Shryuken Super Combo had most of the frames chopped out and it still slows the game down to a crawl. The slowdown and missing frames are so bad and so noticeable that they have a detrimental effect on the already bad gameplay. The Ruthless review closes with, at some point in the development cycle, someone should have stepped in, seen that the PlayStation simply couldn't do justice to the original game, and pulled the plug. I like the Street Fighter series as much as the next guy, but this is taking it way too far. The brown icing on the turd cake in this story was this was the only home version of the game available to play in the West at the time, unless you purchased an import copy. With the PlayStation game being so different to its Saturn counterpart over in Japan, they didn't even try to claim that these two titles were the same game, and instead the PlayStation title would be sold as X-Men vs Street Fighter EX Edition. Now, um, going back to my personal opinion on this whole matter, I believe that as gimped as this game is compared to its Saturn and arcade counterparts, it is not anywhere near as bad as some of these reviewers make it out. It still offers the novelty of being able to play as the X-Men and the cast of Street Fighter in the same game, which is all that half the casual market would have wanted from this anyway. So it offered something no other home game in the Western market did. Some may not have been aware of how different this game was from its arcade and Saturn brothers. In all of this anger that seemed to be directed towards Capcom in these reviews, you could argue that the reviewers should have been angry with the PlayStation user base instead, who chose to back the system with their wallets that performed so poorly at handling 2D games in the first place. Yuck! From Capcom's perspective, their hands were clearly a bit tired in this situation, as the PlayStation essentially was the only system worth making games for in the West during the game's release window, which was a crying shame considering how imperfect it was as a console. They entered this situation very reluctantly and were answering consumer demand to the best that they could with the hardware they had at their disposal. All in all, it is very clear that if you want to experience X-Men vs Street Fighter at its best, the arcade or the Sega Saturn is the way to go. However, the PlayStation version is not the total garbage it is often made out to be. It's just not the same game as it was in the arcade. To summarise, the X-Men vs Street Fighter release story is interesting, full of controversy, criticism and even critical acclaim. The game has a legacy as polarising as any, as both astonishing and hilarious in equal measures to go back and explore. From all of this, you can see why both the audience and fans alike were outraged at different points through this game's story. The sequel to the Street Fighter X-Men crossover would arrive in Japanese arcades as quickly as July 1997. 10 months after Wolverine and company had graced us with their presence in a Capcom fighter previously. In order to be able to pump out another game of this flavour so quickly, it is very clear that Capcom used their previous crossover outing as a base and worked from there. So what would be the same and what would be different? As expected, Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter would once again be programmed to run off of the Capcom CP System 2 arcade hardware, 
and like with any profitable arcade game, a decent attract mode would be included in order to get gamers to part with their cash and insert their precious small round things into Capcom's alluring slot. So let's look at this game's introduction. Are you ready, true believers? Capcom and Marvel have joined forces once again to bring you It's Marvel Superheroes vs. Street Fighter! Survive a <laughs> adventure! Don't miss out on the enjoyment of a lifetime! Behold, amazing fantasy! Don't miss the most amazing tag team fighting game ever! Are you ready for a new challenger? Like Rock! To be fair, that entire sequence was pretty epic, offering up not only glimpses of comic book icons squaring off against Capcom's combatants, but the entire sequence is pushed over the edge by the absolutely wonderful announcer's voice. Maybe I need to hire that guy to tell people to subscribe to this channel. Welcome to the adventure, hint hint. This utter vocal lunatic hangs around throughout, and beyond the game's delightfully flashy attract scenes, he is omnipresent on the character select screen too, playfully challenging gamers to choose their alter ego. Wonderful. Speaking of the character select screen, the roster differs quite significantly from the previous X-Men vs Street Fighter title. On the Street Fighter side of things, we once again have 9 characters from that franchise, with a further 8 representatives by Marvel. Some players at the time may have been disappointed that on the Street Fighter side not much has changed here, with only two fighters being switched out for others. Charlie and Cammy are out and in their place are the comical Dan and the affable Sakura. The latter in my opinion being a particularly strong choice as thematically she fits the game very well. Part of this character was after all influenced by the Japanese high school girl superhero archetype, utilised in the likes of Sailor Moon. Sakura is hugely popular in Japan, so having her do battle with and alongside western superheroes could have only helped aid sales. The Japanese love schoolgirls. So Sakura was added to the mix for the sake of popularity with Dan being included likely to add a semblance of comic relief. This overconfident, arrogant and utterly feeble character never fails to entertain me and can always lighten the mood. The Marvel side though is where characters are really mixed up as obviously the prior entry only had X-Men. In fact, only Cyclops and Wolverine make a return in this game, opening up the other roster spots to other Marvel heroes and villains. Joining the originals we have Captain America, The Incredible Hulk and Spider-Man, some of the most iconic comic book characters ever. And joining them in the remaining roster spots we have Shuma Gorath, Blackheart and Omega Red who I must say are some arguably questionable choices. So why did Capcom do this you may ask? Well this is where accusations of laziness can be easily brought in. You see when it comes to the roster of this fighting game, Capcom did not bother to create any new character sprites for either Marvel or Street Fighter characters. Instead each of these was simply lifted and recycled from previous games. All the Street Fighter sprite work is taken from the Street Fighter Alpha series and the Marvel character sprites are either from Capcom's previous Marvel Super Heroes game or X-Men Children of the Atom. Those who had played the prior titles would be completely familiar with this base roster, which was a tad disappointing. Fortunately the game does include some secret characters, but Capcom decided to lazily take a leaf out of Mortal Kombat's playbook by offering palette swaps of existing characters but giving them different names. These include ridiculous oddities such as Armored Spider-Man, Evil Sakura, Mech Zangief and more. My particular favourite of these is US Agent as it sounds like the name you would see written on the packaging of an unlicensed Captain America costume in an attempt to avoid infringement. Also yes, I do know US Agent is an actual official Marvel character but it still sounds super Chinese bootleg. So the roster in the arcade game is essentially just a mix of characters from pre-existing Capcom titles. But what about if we look past this? Does the rest of the game bring much freshness forward? Beyond the roster we of course have the game's stages themselves. Sadly it does not appear that any of these are new but once again just old assets that have been slightly tweaked. From everything we have covered so far it's actually quite difficult to look at Marvel's superheroes versus Street Fighter as even a standalone game 
as a case can be made that it was just a newer version of X-Men vs Street Fighter. Much in the same way that Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting was an upgraded Champion Edition. Speaking of things that are the same, you even do battle with Apocalypse again, at the end of the playthrough. However, to be fair to the game, there is a cool twist which personally I think was very entertaining. Past Apocalypse, another opponent lays in wait, the infamous Cyber Akuma. Yes, he is basically just a Terminator wearing a pair of sandals, but he provides a tough challenge to gamers who are looking to defeat this Hadouken for a maniac. Scary stuff. When it comes to an upgrade of a previous Capcom fighting game, a feature you would expect most from such a project would be some balancing and refinement to combat, with perhaps a few new mechanics trickled in here and there. In Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter's case, the notable addition to the gameplay is something known as a variable assists. Using this new technique, the player can summon their off-screen character to perform a special attack without switching their currently controlled fighter out of play. This opens up a realm of new possible combos during matches, which further expand on the purpose of having a second character at your disposal. All in all, this improves on the tag team action, and as a result, this mechanic was continually carried over to further entries in the Versus series. So that's another massive positive in this one's favour. According to Seth Killian, a former Capcom USA community manager, commenting on this game previously, he stated that the primary goal with Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter was to tone down the insanity that occurred on screen when compared to in X-Men vs Street Fighter. Basically, what he meant by this was that the developers wanted to make the game more competitive and balanced. Now, X-Men vs Street Fighter is an extremely fun, chaotic game. But due to coding flaws and a lack of beta testing, gamers can pull off infinite combos. Many gamers were hugely entertained by this, but to make the affair more competitive, Capcom would ultimately release three different versions of the X-Men crossover in an attempt to remove this unintended feature. Capcom did try their best to remove all the known infinites. However, their efforts to remove all of them was ultimately futile. So what for Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter? Well, developers finally had the opportunity to rewrite what they perceived as wrongs, so would seek to create a fighter they deemed less broken. To be fair to Capcom, they were fairly successful in achieving this feat. However, quite amusingly, fan reception at the time was fairly negative with regards to these changes, as they looked at the game to be offering them less freedom than with the previous entry. Proof that sometimes games prefer something a little less sanitary and rougher around the edges. A case could be made that the chaotic nature of X-Men vs Street Fighter was one of the reasons that many fell in love with the game to begin with. So with the infinites gone, some felt a layer of charm had been removed. So this is what gamers would receive from the arcade game. But what about the home ports? It doesn't require a rocket scientist to hypothesize that since the game is so similar to X-Men vs Street Fighter, that porting the game to home platforms was a process that Capcom would know how to do. The problem was though, that with the prior game there was a huge quality difference between the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation versions of the title. So bearing in mind the architectural differences the systems had, was the PlayStation's 2D performance destined to make history repeat itself? Let's take a look at what people thought. The first home version of this game would see a release in October of 1998 for the Sega Saturn. The Saturn by this point was essentially a dead duck in the West, so sadly this version was made exclusively for the Japanese market. This conversion was obviously very arcade accurate. After all, you have to remember that the Saturn port, like with X-Men vs Street Fighter, was supported by the 4MB RAM expansion peripheral. This allowed the developers to create a conversion which retained the original frame rates and tag team system. But what did the gaming media think of the game when we consider its strong similarities to what came before it? GameSpot's review of the Saturn title was a mixed bag. They stated graphically the game is very very good, the sprites are extremely well animated and the backgrounds are all packed with movement, giving the game a nice busy look. It's a perfect conversion of the arcade game, that much we know. But that doesn't really stop it from being a near carbon copy of X-Men vs Street Fighter. From here, GameSpot would go on to roast the future PlayStation edition of the game, stating, It's pretty much a given that this version is going to easily smoke the PlayStation version. If you're still interested in the Saturn, then this game is definitely one to import. 
Digital Extremes gave the game a glowing review, summarising that the title is another arcade perfect 4 megabyte translation from Capcom. Too bad it's probably going to be the last. If you're looking for a great Saturn fighter, give Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter a shot. German publication Video Games added to the Saturn games praise by stating, The game gives the beat em up community another potential fun hit. As you would expect, you will be spoiled with excellent animated characters and backgrounds. Marvel vs Street Fighter is another Saturn jewel in the 2D fighting game genre. So looking at all of these reviews and looking at the conversion myself, it is easy to conclude that once again Capcom have managed to pull off the feat of getting this game to run fantastically on the Saturn, looking near arcade perfect as a result. So in most cases the gaming media were impressed once again. The only real drawback though was that they too noted that it was essentially just X-Men vs Street Fighter with a different roster and a few tweaks, just as highlighted earlier in the video. But I have saved the best for you with the Saturn section of the story for last, with things getting a little crazy here. Essentially there's one more character I thought we would save talking about until we reached this point. The all new ridiculous playable character known as Nori Maro. Sadly, due to licensing issues, this character can only be found in the Japanese versions of the game, with a Saturn version obviously being left in Japan due to the Saturn being essentially a dead system in the West. Norimaro can be found on every Saturn disc. The character is the creation of a Japanese comedian, Noritaki Kinashi. So as expected, Norimaro is placed in this zany game as a sort of comic relief character. I guess Dan just wasn't enough. Oh yeah, speaking of Dan, one of the versions of the game features Cyber Dan, which is absolutely epic. One final note worth mentioning in regard to the Saturn version of a title is that an additional mode of play had been added to the conversion. This extra bit of content is known as Survival Mode, which basically lets you square off against multiple opponents using just one life bar. Standard console release stuff. But what would be a Capcom vs series retrospective video without discussing the Sony PlayStation? The PlayStation version of Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter would be reported on in October of 1998 by IGN, which was four months before this conversion would arrive on the system, not reaching the platform until February of 1999. IGN reported that Capcom were aiming to circumvent PlayStation's memory restrictions at least partially due to the negative backlash that hampered the PlayStation version of X-Men vs Street Fighter previously. Upon the game's February 1999 PlayStation release, the game would feature five modes of play, known as Battle, Versus, Training, Hero Battle and Crossover Mode. Sadly though, once again Teddy Long was very disappointed, as the conversion was once again missing the tag team mechanic players which was obviously due to the same reasons as before. Capcom were once again unable to overcome the issue of the Sony system not being able to hold four character animations in its working memory simultaneously. As for the notable modes, Hero Battle is a sort of endurance mode, where both yourself and your opponent pick a selection of fighters each, with the competitor who manages to KO the entirety of the opposing team being declared the winner. Nothing mind-blowing really, but it's something. GameSpot would describe crossover mode as follows, it allows you to pick two characters, then the computer uses the same character you picked. This limits the amount of information the PlayStation has to handle to two characters instead of four. If you are victorious in this battle, the computer swaps one of the characters each of you have for another. This is done so you aren't playing with and against the same two characters each fight. To put it simply, this mode is a kind of compensatory one for the traditional tag team action being missing. However, reviewers such as GameSpot were unimpressed by this, commenting, It gives you the tag team experience of the arcade, but having to deal with the rotating character thing and having to fight mirror images of yourself is extremely weak in comparison. Speaking of GameSpot, they were the entity who gave X-Men vs Street Fighter on the PlayStation an outrageous verbal bashing. Overall, however, this time around, they do not seem to hold quite as harsh an opinion, appearing slightly more balanced with the latter game. They wrote, Visually, Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter looks good, but when you compare it with its arcade counterpart, it simply fails. The colours aren't nearly as vibrant, and the game suffers from quite a bit of slowdown. Street Fighter fans will definitely feel the typical Street Fighter gameplay, 
But in the end, it's all a question of how starved you are for another Street Fighter game. IGN added similar review feedback stating, while there's no denying that Marvel's Super Heroes vs Street Fighter is a fast, fun and solid fighting game, it certainly isn't without flaws. The aforementioned lack of true tag team play is one that will seriously affect players who are used to the arcade version. I certainly wouldn't recommend it to those who didn't enjoy X-Men vs Street Fighter or those who are looking for something truly innovative from their next fighting game. All in all, the three versions of this game all display a range of similarities in terms of both strengths and weaknesses, with the three versions that were released of X-Men vs Street Fighter previously. So, the story of the arcade game and its ports mirror one another, which isn't surprising at all considering this newer game is nothing more than a revision, well at least according to many. Given just how similar Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter is to X-Men vs Street Fighter, it isn't surprising that many people view this game as the black sheep of the Marvel vs Capcom family. Well, at least the black sheep until Marvel vs Capcom Infinite came along anyway, but that's a whole nother story. Perhaps consumers may have felt a little less misled if the publisher had have called this game X-Men vs Street Fighter Marvel Super Heroes Edition or something so that gamers had more of an idea of what sort of experience they were in for. But then again, would they have made as many sales if the title wasn't marketed as a separate game? Let me know what you think down below. Title in the game Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter certainly did make the most business sense in my opinion, but bearing in mind all of the recycled sprite work, stages and gameplay, it's not surprising at all that it rubbed many gamers the wrong way. Still, if you view this game through the lens of an upgrade, there is still a lot to love about it. A Street Fighter roster alongside Spider-Man, The Incredible Hulk and Captain America for the first time. A legendary boss battle with Cyber Akuma, Cyber Dan. Then we have rebalancing and fine tuning for those who prefer their games to be more fair and competitive. And all of that is without mentioning the introduction of assists, which would play a part in every Marvel vs Capcom game going forward. I can see sensible reasons why some would consider this one a bit special, but at the same time I can also see why a lack of chaos and originality may have put a lot of people off, with those folks seeing this as no more than a cheeky cash grab. I on the other hand think it's probably both. What an evil fence-sitting centrist I am. I noted previously that there was only a 10 month gap between the release of X-Men vs Street Fighter and Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter, which is an incredibly small amount of time even by cash grabbing Capcom standards. But what you may find even more amusing is that there would be an even smaller window between Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter and Marvel vs Capcom, with this time there being a mere 6 month gap between entries, which is insane when you think about it. These crossovers were just some of the fighting games that Capcom were bringing out at the time as well, with Street Fighter Alpha 3, Street Fighter EX2 and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure all being examples of other Capcom published fighting games that saw release that year. All we seem to get from Capcom these days is a new Street Fighter game every 7 years or so, so it was clearly a very different time. So what did they do with Marvel vs Capcom to try and make it stand out from everything else they had on the market? Well, build on the crossover format of course. To expand on the crossover idea, since the previous game incorporated a roster of Street Fighter characters alongside fighters from the greater Marvel Universe, the next logical step in the series was to expand the roster on the Capcom side of things. This meant that this new game would include characters from other Capcom games, rather than just relying on the presence of Street Fighters. So with all of this in mind, let's start breaking this one down, starting with checking out the arcade games of track mode. Capcom presents. Capcom presents. That's some pretty epic hype to be fair, but what else could be expected of this series? From the initial character select screen, you will notice that this game initially offers 15 different playable characters, 
including the return of several from the previous games in the series. In terms of Street Fighters, Ryu, Chun-Li and Zangief all return, while Wolverine, Spider-Man, Captain America and the Hulk are all back on the Marvel side. On top of this, Gambit also returns for the first time since X-Men vs Street Fighter, a welcome returnee when we consider how popular this character is. If you suckers can count, you may have noted that I just listed off 8 fighters, meaning the other 7 characters are all brand new additions to this crossover series, and all in all decent additions they are, so let us briefly touch on each of them. On the Marvel side of things, there are only 2 new fighters though, so let us start off by covering those. Firstly, we have War Machine from the Iron Man franchise, which may or may not be a palette swap of Iron Man from the Marvel superheroes fighting game. Secondly, a much more exciting character was introduced, fricking Venom, one of my all-time favourite Marvel characters. If you grew up in the 90s, you will probably be able to recall what a huge deal Venom was, with this villain becoming highly popular through the success of the Spider-Man animated series on the Fox Kids Network. So, great choice there. When I first played this one as a youngster, Venom would instantly become one of my go-to choices as a result. But being another of Teddy Long's favourites, this game would feature tag team matches players, so I would get to select another fighter to team up with Venom. This brings me to my favourite Capcom addition to the game, Mega Man. In the words of Sheev Palpatine, this was a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one, as I never expected to see him included in a game like this. You see, Mega Man always felt particularly special to me, as I was always the only person at school who liked or had even heard of these franchise. Growing up in the UK, the NES was never a particularly popular platform, so most people missed his games during the 8-bit era. However, for me personally, the Mega Man X games were some of the crown jewels in my childhood Super Nintendo collection. Mega Man X on the Super Nintendo didn't sell very well, due to no brand recognition being built up in the region during Nintendo's 8-bit days. This meant that I felt like I was the only one in the world who loved the Mega Man, even though, from what I now know, he was massive in the United States and Japan. Seeing him amongst this star-studded lineup, I guess was really my first glimpse of what a big deal this character truly was. Being able to play as Venom and Mega Man against a cast of X-Men and Street Fighter characters felt like the craziest yet coolest concept for a game that had ever been conceived. And, retrospectively, I do not think I was wrong in my thinking either. To accompany Mega Man, we would also get the debut of Strider Hariu from the Strider Hack and Slash platforming series, Jin Sayatomi from the Cyberbots series, Captain Commando from the 1991 side scrolling beat em up, and of course Morrigan, who had built up a strong reputation and fan following through the awesome Darkstalkers series. What the? She's a goddamn succubus! Succubus trying to take my baby! On top of the 15 initial playable characters, the game also features a number of secret characters, a number of which are palette swaps, such as Shadow Lady, who is a variant of Chun Li, and Red Venom, who is a palette swap of Venom. A trope that was carried over from Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter. Roll is also present from a Mega Man series, who features the same moveset as Mega Man, however at least with this one, she features her own unique sprite. Outside of the selectable characters though, there are actually even more in-game characters to talk about, however we shall get to the rest shortly. In terms of actually playing this game, many of the mechanics established in the previous Marvel and Capcom crossover games make a welcome return here. Expectedly at the game's heart, this is a traditional fighter, however several additional elements are included that enhance the action, including the good old tag team mechanics and aerial combat, which we have already touched on earlier in the video. Hyper combos are also back, however combat wise there is one major shift in gameplay. Remember the variable assists we talked about when covering Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter, where the player could call upon their off-screen characters and perform a special attack? Well, this feature has been removed. Instead, we have in its place a guest character special partner system, which brings me on to talking about what guest characters actually are. To put it simply, on top of the characters we have already discussed, there are a further 20 which are known as guest characters. These include some pretty famous faces, such as Cyclops, Jubilee, Thor, and even bloody Arthur from Ghosts and Goblins. These characters are drawn upon for extra support during battles, and are randomly allocated to players prior to a fight. These can be called upon a few times per bout, and can be used when executing new techniques that made their debut in this game, such as variable crosses, aka the duo team attacks, 
A variable cross allows you to attack your opponent with both characters at the same time for a limited period, essentially double team manoeuvres. Build on the newness, the game features an all new soundtrack that mixes a range of entirely new melodies with remixes of long established tracks that have been featured in previous Capcom games. Along with the musical changes, the game also introduced all new stage backdrops, a hugely welcome change when you take into account that X-Men vs Street Fighter and Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter lazily both included the same stages, despite being marketed as different games. In addition to the new fighting mechanics, Apocalypse and Cyber Akuma, who were end bosses in the previous game, have been removed. In their place is an all-new final encounter against Onslaught to originate from the X-Men series. This fight with Onslaught is notorious for being amongst the most difficult bosses in fighting games and is considered by many to be quite simply the hardest boss in the series. He can perform attacks that do colossal damage, many of which are inescapable. He has two challenging forms, the first of which is tall and highly evasive, the second of which can fly around the background and take up most of the screen. Despite his huge, ominous presence, only a small part of his body is vulnerable to damage, making this even more challenging. All in all, this arcade game includes plenty of new content that greatly separates Marvel vs Capcom to all the crossover games that came before it. But what for the console ports? Let's take a deep dive look. Now with previous entries in the series, they have been ported over to the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation, with the Saturn versions of the game massively outperforming the entries found on the PlayStation. By this point in time, Sega had released an all new home console in the form of a Sega Dreamcast. So this time around, Capcom had even more power at their disposal when bringing this arcade game home. The arcade version of the game, like its predecessor, was developed for the CP System 2 arcade hardware, with it being revealed that it would be ported over to the Dreamcast during the 1998 Tokyo Game Show. This version of the game would be particularly special, as it would feature a mode known as Cross Fever which would allow up to four separate players to compete in the same tag team matches simultaneously. The Dreamcast version of the game, which was ported to the Dreamcast in 1999, would go on to receive rave reviews from journalists, such as GameSpot stating, Graphically, Marvel vs Capcom looks terrific, and once and for all proves that the Dreamcast can definitely do justice to 2D games. Even when four characters are on screen, filling the arena with projectiles, while the background goes crazy, the game doesn't slow down a bit. The utter lack of load times keeps the game moving along at a nice, brisk pace. The soundtrack, which comprises music from all sorts of different Capcom games, is unmatched. The game's sound effects are also crystal clear and extremely well done. The copious use of stereo separation helps make the audio perfect. While I wouldn't call Marvel vs Capcom the most balanced fighting game in the world, it makes up for its shortcomings by simply being a whole lot of fun. After pumping out inferior vs games for a few years now, Capcom have finally gotten it right. Marvel vs Capcom is everything you'd expect from an over the top, ultra flashy fighter, and then some. IGN had equal praise for the game, particularly in the graphical department. They were very impressed with the game's art style, and expressed this by saying, Everything from the way Venom moves his tongue to Gambit's trench coat blowing in the wind is done with such precision. That feast in your eyes upon it is more like experiencing a Saturday morning cartoon than a video game. At even the most frantic moments of combo madness, the backgrounds and characters move just as fluidly as they did before the insanity began. In fact, it's so visually orgasmic that I couldn't help but smile and smile big whenever something cool happened. 32-bit systems can't do this stuff, folks. IGN went on to praise all the modes of gameplay this version of the game includes, such as the return of survival mode and the introduction of Cross Fever. To summarise, they stated, taking everything into consideration, Marvel vs Capcom is an excellent post-launch purchase. With the mini-glut of fighting titles available for the system by the end of October, this is definitely one of your better choices, if not the best. It's certainly the best 2D title on the system until Street Fighter Alpha 3 rolls into town, so don't pass this one up. So as demonstrated by the Dreamcast version of Marvel vs Capcom's universal praise, the game is not only arcade perfect, but offers a range of play modes that can only be experienced in this version of the game, arguably making this game better than what can be experienced in the arcades. Which to be frank, was what the Sega Dreamcast was all about. The platform was far ahead of its time and in many ways more innovative than many systems that preceded it several years later. I'm looking at you Nintendo GameCube, 
Now, moving away from the Dreamcast version of the game, we have to also touch on the PlayStation version. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, in a world where we had the ultra-slick, barely-priced Sega Dreamcast available to experience at home, the majority of gamers skipped it and just stuck with the feeble PS1 instead. Fortunately, I was not one of those people, but a lot of people denied themselves the magic of the world's most powerful game console. So with most gamers of the age being tight-fisted and saving their money for the non-existent yet PS2, they stuck with the humble 32-bit PlayStation. With the PlayStation's user base being so large, Capcom's hand would be forced once again to create a port of their demanding 2D sprite-based game for a system that was generally terrible at handling them. We've already discussed at length when discussing X-Men vs Street Fighter and Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter about how the PS1 simply wasn't capable of holding four different sets of sprite animations for fighting game characters in its working memory simultaneously. This meant that one of the main draws of the series, being tag team matches involving four different beloved characters, simply wasn't possible on the hardware. But to be fair to Capcom, they would at least get better at producing PlayStation versions of these fighting games with each passing title, with Marvel vs Capcom being by far the most refined of the bunch. Additional familiar issues return, such as certain characters having missing animation frames, long load times existing, and of course a lack of proper tag action. But the game offers a lot more differences than it is often credited for. Known as Marvel vs Capcom Clash of Superheroes EX Edition in Japan, it carries the EX branding in the nation as it is essentially a different game to what can be found in arcades. Rather than simply just being a poor imitation of its arcade counterpart, it seems Capcom would try harder to make this game stand out and be different from the crossover games that had previously been ripped apart for the PlayStation by critics. As in the X game, the title obviously already had elements that separated it from its source game, most notably the one-on-one -on -one round based matches. For the bouts in this game, a number of mechanical changes were implemented to separate gameplay further, with differences added that an argument could be made were actually for the betterment of the port this time around rather than simply due to system limitations. In fact, some new features for the EX edition are so extensive it can be argued that this port served as a testing ground for mechanics and features that would later be a huge part of Marvel vs Capcom 2. The craziest example of this relates to the fact that the EX version of a game contains delayed hyper combos. DHCs would play an integral part in Marvel vs Capcom 2's play and describe when you cancel the super attack of your point character with a super from the next character. In this version of the game, fighters can also cancel hyper combos into another hyper combo, essentially meaning the whole experience gives players more things that they can do in combat to somewhat make up for the lack of tag team action. Due to this, there are a number of move combinations that can only be performed in this version of the game. For example, in the PlayStation port, Mega Man gets a secret third hyper combo based on his ending, Onslaught's Magnetic Shockwave. To use it, one has to win the game with him and then choose him while holding the select button. In fact, lots of examples can be found online of players performing all sorts of weird and wonderful attack combinations that can only be performed in this very specific version of the game. Further changes include a new zoom in effect when fighters perform air combos, a feature known as dynamic mode, which if players find too distracting, they can manually turn off. There are also more palette swaps on offer, allowing gamers to play as fighters in more different attires than in other versions. When we consider that the PlayStation version of the game was never going to fare as critically well as its Sega Dreamcast counterpart, it is really cool to go back and see that rather than just pushing out another underappreciated PlayStation conversion of a crossover game, Capcom appear to have used this moment as an opportunity to experiment with mechanics to utilise in the future resulting in a video game that offers something different than other EX crossover games that came before it. When it comes to Marvel vs Capcom reaching home systems, the 2D power class divide between Sega and Sony hardware was greater than ever, which makes it all the cooler to see that they went an extra mile with the PlayStation version to give it some saving graces over other iterations of the game. In my mind, Marvel vs Capcom Clash of Superheroes was another significant step forward in relation to the evolution of the Marvel vs Capcom series overall. This game was certainly the most ambitious crossover event in history to date, and a significant chapter in gaming history right up until this very day. This was, after all, the game that solidified the Marvel vs Capcom name as a brand of fighting game. But what is even more impressive, the best was still to come. Capcom presents.
Rah, that isn't showing off a ton of fighting like in previous introductions. I guess Capcom must have felt that the brand was now in a strong enough position that rather than instantly showing off gameplay, they would instead tout the insane amount of new gameplay features and mechanics that Marvel vs Capcom 2 brought to the table. This includes revealing a ludicrously large lineup of fighters in this jazzy sequence. So let's begin getting down to the nitty gritty and discussing in depth what can be found within. Reflecting back on what came before this one, there were minor mechanical differences between all the previous games, but the most significant change between each was simply the roster of characters available. The three titles offered less than 20 playable characters each, but had a different lineup depending on the game's theme, so the next game would have to be something bigger and grander than ever before. Now perhaps the obvious move for Capcom to make would be to make Marvel vs Capcom 2 a polygonal fighting game. But thankfully, the company would instead opt to make an outrageously refined sprite based fighter, which was nice. But unlike with the previous efforts, the backgrounds and visual effects would be rendered in 3D this time, giving a game a distinct look against the title's predecessors. This makes the game the first in the franchise to feature a 2.5D graphical style, and beautiful it is. Before we talk about the depth, the amount of mechanical changes, and most this epic game received, let's talk about the bloody roster as in my opinion, it is one of the most incredible things about this game. If not one of the most incredible things in gaming full stop. The selection of fighters to choose from in this one is amazing. You start the game out with a character selection of 24, but there are a further 32 to unlock. All in all giving you a complete roster of a whopping 56 characters. A choice of fighters that was so large it was almost unheard of in other fighting games. Sheer lunacy, but lunacy I certainly appreciated. This game's exciting roster would see a return of most of the characters from the previous Capcom vs games, along with characters who had not been seen in fighting games since the likes of X-Men Children of the Atom, and Marvel superheroes such as Psylocke and Iron Man making welcomed returns to the mix for example. But of course, all of this fighter wise was just the tip of the iceberg, as the game was packed full of complete newcomers as well. So let's talk about some of these. Firstly on the Marvel side of things, we have two new playable characters. These consist of Cable, the son of Cyclops and his first wife Madeline Pryor. Cable was a popular character who was nice to see in the game. In a more off the wall choice, but one I appreciate, we then have Marrow, a mutant whose bones grow out of her skin which can be removed from her body, providing her with potential knives and clubs as well as body armour. Epic. There are even more new fighters on the Capcom side of things too, so let's run through each of them. First we have a Mingo, who has never even appeared in games outside of the Capcom vs series. Essentially a Mingo is a sentient cactus man hybrid, with a large rotund belly who dresses in Mexican apparel and carries a guitar around with him. Like a Pokemon his only form of speech is repeating his own name over and over again which raises the point, is this bugger a Pokemon? Amingo has an arsenal of very unique attacks at his disposal. This includes a special attack known as the Shout of the Wind which involved Amingo managing to turn himself into a ball in order to hurl himself at opponents. Ridiculous. There has been rumours that he is a rejected Darkstalkers character, whereas other sources point to his game being cancelled. Either way, he is an oddity who is appreciated. Also about a game of her own we have Ruby Hart, a French speaking pirate captain who earned a prominent reputation sailing the seas. Believe it or not she was created to be one of this title's main protagonists, with her having a major role in the game's crazy story. While there is clearly no reason for this title to really need a story, it has one nonetheless and Ruby Hart is well, at the heart of it. According to the game's plot, this French speaking pirate has a fiery reputation that is well known throughout the seven seas. Like any good pirate, Ruby is said to be a treasure hunter who along with her crew on the flying ship named the Partnier, the group are constantly on the lookout for things of value to add to her collection. She has lots of crazy attacks including the Partnier that involves her summoning her ship, then ramming her opponents with it and shooting cannonballs at them. She also has a crazy combo whereby Ruby's crew drop a barrel on top of opponents heads, allowing her to throw blades at their trapped bodies. If this attack looks familiar to you, that's because it is, 
as it is a reference to the popular children's board game known as Pop-Up Pirate, which like Marvel vs Capcom 2 itself, is also a Japanese game. As for this strange character who felt like they seemingly came out of nowhere to be included in this now legendary title, according to Capcom's old community manager Seth Killian, he has stated in the past that she was actually an old rejected concept character who was produced to be part of the Darkstalker series. A fact that at a later date, Yoshinori Ono of Street Fighter producing fame would also back up. It's inclusions like this which make Marvel vs Capcom 2 feel even more off of the wall than other games. While on the subject of Darkstalkers, Morrigan returns to the Versus franchise, but this time Anakara's baby Bonnie Hood and Felicia join her, enhancing Darkstalkers' prominence within the Capcom vs. series. Mega Man and Roll are back too, but this time joined by characters from Mega Man Legends series of all places, which I guess was still relevant around this game's release. So from the Mega Man universe, the new additions to the roster include Tron Bon, the anti-hero member of the Bon family of air pirates who had received a Capcom game in her own right titled The Misadventures of Tron Bon previously. Joining her there is also Servbot, one of the many all-purpose support robots that Tron Bon built in the Legends series. In terms of more off the war additions, one of the most surprising roster members added was Sun Sun, Sun Sun, although created specifically for Marvel vs Capcom 2, she is at least connected to another Capcom game. This small monkey girl is described to be the daughter of the original Sun Sun, a male character who appeared in the 1984 arcade title of the same name. The 2D side-scrolling platformer like Dragon Ball is loosely based on the Chinese novel known as Journey to the West, a quirky character to include in a game and a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. As for new playable characters, finally we have Jill Valentine, whose addition would be no surprise when considering Resident Evil's massive success during the 90s. The anime art style she is depicted in in this game is also massively refreshing and different from her appearances in any games previously, all in all making her one of my favourite additions to Marvel vs Capcom's roster. So now we have gotten through talking about all these new fighters, let's begin talking about the development of this vast game. As mentioned in previous videos, all the prior Versus games were programmed to run on Capcom System 2 arcade boards, the same boards which would run the Street Fighter Alpha series in the arcades. Marvel vs Capcom 2, on the other hand, was developed to run on completely different hardware. In fact, this was the first ever fighting game that Capcom would develop themselves that did not utilise the abilities of Capcom's arcade boards. Instead, the game would be created to run on the Sega Naomi arcade board, which used the same electronic components as the Sega Dreamcast. The Naomi had twice as much system memory, twice as much video memory, and four times as much sound memory as its home console counterpart. But all in all, this was the perfect hardware to make a game on, that was intended to be ported over to the powerful Sega home console. The game was first announced on December the 1st, 1999, and on that same day, it was revealed that Japanese home and arcade versions would be compatible via the Dreamcast VMU. The feature announced would allow players to exchange data between the two versions, earning them experience points which could be used to unlock characters, stages and costumes. It was also announced that day that the game would feature online play between Dreamcast players, which was available through a network known as a matching service. Due to technical limitations, this feature was removed from all international ports of the Dreamcast game though. Thanks to the technical similarities between the Naomi and the Dreamcast, it would only be a matter of months in Japan before the game's arcade version would reach homes in March of 2000. Fortunately, the title would also reach other shores worldwide by the summer of that same year too, meaning the world could enjoy this absolute classic. Now we have covered this game's exciting roster and the hardware this game could be run on, what for the gameplay mechanics that can be found in it? Well, Marvel vs Capcom 2 New Age of Heroes brings back tag team fighting, which is why Teddy Long loves this series over any other gaming franchise. Holla 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 players. Play modes this time around deviate though, offering gamers more choice than ever before. Instead of simply picking two fighters for yourself to face off against other tag teams with, we can now choose three to face off against teams of opponents in 3 on 3 combat, instantly establishing a practical purpose for the game's massive roster of fighters. How awesome. Like in previous games, if a damaged character tags out, they could slowly regenerate health when not in play, instantly adding more strategy to this madness. The Unonis of a variable system would also make a return in this game, however it is more refined this time around. The variable system mechanic first introduced in Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter allowed players to call upon their off-screen teammates to join their currently selected characters to perform a single special move to aid them. 
All characters also have three assists, varying from projectile moves to healing techniques. The hyper combo gauge also returns, gradually filling as players both deal and receive damage. Once this is full, characters can use this power again to perform hyper combos that deal heavy damage. Using the meter, the player can also perform delay types of combos that execute multiple hyper combos simultaneously and variable combinations, allowing the player to use all three of their characters to perform hyper combos simultaneously. Absolute mayhem. Other mechanical changes include snapback, which forces opponents to switch between characters. The game's actual controls have been modified too, changing from a title with six different attack buttons to four attack buttons and two assist ones. This move is said to have made the game more accessible to casual players. The game would obviously feature both single and multiplayer modes of play, which you would expect from an arcade fighter from the period. The game's arcade mode obviously and traditionally consists of a player fighting through various encounters until finally reaching the game's end boss. But before reaching such a destination, the player must defeat seven teams of three to be able to take on the game's main villain. The final boss fight takes place against Abyss, who in typical final boss fashion has three different forms you must defeat. In this particular instance, the three forms also allow for the three-on-three -three play style of the game to persist in some way throughout the fight. Abyss is a character created specifically for this game, which happens to be a legendary creature forgotten by time and is believed to be just a fairy tale. Abyss is said to be a forbidden weapon sealed away in an underground temple where it's been told that for centuries it has been in a deep sleep. According to the game's lore, Ruby Hart was the one who accidentally awoke this character, who as a result would transport the Capcom and Marvel fighters via an airship to help stop it. If the game's arcade mode is not enough for you, and you want to hone your skills, the title also offers players a training mode, which allows them to practice moves and combos whilst not in direct competitive combat. On top of this, there is also a score attack mode, which is similar to arcade mode, only where the player's primary objective is to get as high a score as possible without the need for a continue. The original arcade game also contains an experience system, giving players an incentive to unlock hidden characters, but the Dreamcast version switches this out for what is known as a secret factor menu. When perusing this menu, players can browse this feature and purchase characters, costumes and stages using the points they earn throughout their playthrough. This element of the game gives the title a level of single player replayability that's arguably a lot higher than with previous entries in the Capcom vs series, or any of the previous Street Fighter games for that matter too. You can get a sense of progression with Marvel vs Capcom 2, which is different from simply getting as good at it as possible. The quest for unlockables is a great incentive to keep players coming back, wondering what else the game has to offer, and a tempting prospect for completionists who enjoy trying to attain everything within the game. To me, this is the kind of feature that should be in every game, let alone just fighters, as it is an easy incentive and a pat on the back to keep going. But then again, most greedy publishers and developers prefer to just put additional content behind paywalls instead nowadays, so unlockables you attain through skill or resilience are a dying gaming feature as of now. But if you like this sort of thing, Marvel vs Capcom 2 on the Dreamcast gives it to you. Now that we have gone through a rundown of a game and its many features, let's hear what some journalists and critics thought of the game on release. Did they like the game as much as many people do today, or were opinions a little different back then? Let's find out. GameSpot reviewed the game favourably, stating, The over-the-top nature of Marvel vs Capcom 2 makes the other vs games look subdued by comparison. Like its predecessor, it isn't the most balanced game in the world, but that doesn't keep it from being a great deal of fun. Fans of the off-kilter action found in the previous Versus games will surely be pleased with Marvel vs Capcom 2, as it represents the first major set of changes the series has ever seen. IGN would lump a ton of praise on the title too, stating, Capcom sets a new watermark in the Versus series of fighters. All fighting fans must have this game. Marvel vs Capcom 2 proves to be one of the best fighting games out there, one of the Dreamcast's most sparkling gems and an awesome experience. Other publications would carry on piling praise onto the game, with the Daily Radar proclaiming the title to be the most fun 2D fighting game of all time, and Hot Games echoes this sentiment by stating it's the best 2D fighting game ever made. So from ploughing through these game reviews from well over 20 years ago, it seems that a common consensus amongst journalists was that Marvel vs Capcom 2 was one of the greatest 2D fighting games ever made by that point, even if it didn't take itself as seriously as many of the others. Fast forward to 2002 and the Sega Dreamcast was dead, 
Sega had officially announced that they would be retiring from the hardware industry and future Capcom games would no longer be appearing on Sega systems. It was a damn shame considering that previous versions of their fighting games on those platforms had been the best around for quite some time. This fallout would result in Marvel vs Capcom 2 receiving two ports, one version for the PlayStation 2 and the other for the Microsoft Xbox, both announced at the Electronic Entertainment Expo in 2002. Once again, like the Dreamcast version of the game, online support would remain exclusive to Japan, despite this being two years removed from the game's previous release. GameSpot would once again cover it, stating, The game had been perfectly translated for new consoles, but also commented that the game's graphics and art style was nowhere near as impressive looking as they were two years prior, saying, The contrast between 2D and 3D doesn't work quite as well as you might like, and the resulting clash makes for sharp looking backgrounds and relatively pixelated character sprites, which to be fair to GameSpot is a Fair point, as a strong case could be made that the whole game may have aged even better if it was all in simple 2D, although I must comment I still quite like these graphical effects. Although GameSpot still looked at the game very favourably, they no longer looked at this as one of the greatest 2D fighters ever, and would even go as far as to state that it has been surpassed on nearly every front since its original release. Games like Guilty Gear X have shown freshly animated and impressively sharp 2D sprites, and Capcom's later releases like Capcom vs SNK2 are simply better games in almost every imaginable way. With regards to the 2002 release, they would summarise with, if you're a hardcore fan of Marvel vs Capcom 2, yet somehow missed the Dreamcast version when it was originally released, this game is a port that you will definitely enjoy, but anyone else can find better fighting games on the market. Personally, over 20 years removed from this re-release, I couldn't disagree more with GameSpot's take, as Marvel vs Capcom 2 and Capcom vs SNK 2 are too different really to even properly compare. As the Marvel offering is more of a fun chaotic party style game you want to play to have a laugh with friends with, where the latter feels certainly more engineered for gamers whose interests focus more on balance and competition. IGN would give the game praise similar to their review two years earlier, although they were sorely disappointed with the lack of online play with the western releases of the game. This thing was particularly sore when you consider the rise of Xbox Live. They would also criticise the load times compared to what could be found on the Dreamcast. Another interesting point to note is that unlike GameSpot, IGN would state that the game even beats out the later released Capcom vs SNK franchise. I guess illustrating how subjective these reviews actually are, and how all of us ultimately need to make our own judgments on many games. The game would resurface again on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in the following generation. The reason for this was mainly because a company known as Backbone Entertainment had developed Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix for the systems in 2008, a game that resulted in many people playing competitively online. After this, many fans would request that they release Marvel vs Capcom 2 on the systems with online play function implemented. As a result, this would become a reality, and the game would be built using the original Dreamcast version's code as a base. But previously most refined home version. Apart from online play, this version would utilise various filter options for character sprites offering smooth, crisp and classic looks. Widescreen support was also implemented. These versions of the games would be available to purchase until 2013 when Capcom announced that Marvel vs Capcom 2 would be removed from Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Network stores, following the apparent expiration of Capcom's licensing contracts with Marvel Comics. On August 5th, 2022, Arcade 1UP revealed a Marvel vs Capcom 2 arcade cabinet during the 2022 Evolution Championship Series. The cabinet includes Wi-Fi connectivity for online multiplayer as well as other games including Marvel vs Capcom Clash of Superheroes, Marvel Superheroes vs Street Fighter, X-Men vs Street Fighter, Marvel Superheroes X-Men Children of the Atom, X-Men Mutant Apocalypse and even Marvel Superheroes in War of the Gems. Very nice. Over the years, the game has remained popular and now sits amongst the most iconic fighting games ever. Since the game's release, it has always been played at fighting game tournaments too, but despite this, is it one of the greatest fighters ever? Well, to re-drum a point home I made earlier, this sort of question can only be subjectively answered, even when we put criteria in the way to help us reach such a conclusion. But for the sake of entertainment, here are my personal thoughts on the matter anyway. I certainly think it is absolutely amazing. The roster is massive, the 3-on-3 three -three mechanics were innovative, and simplified controls made the game more accessible to players of all skill levels. To top this off, the crazy amount of unlockables give this game tons of replay value for those who enjoy a single-player completionist experience. 
In many ways, this fighting game offered more than any fighter previously. Some criticised the game for being unbalanced, but then again, the Versus series is not meant to be about balance in the first place. It's about chaos and fun, which this game offers in abundance. It is about different strokes for different folks, but I can see why many people would get more enjoyment out of this game than many others. This title feels huge. Pair all of the elements together that make Marvel vs Capcom 2 so great, then this is why it is the ultimate dream game, in my opinion. No Capcom crossover game has brought this level of insanity since. Sadly though, in the events following the release of this game, Capcom would run into legal issues with Marvel that would put the series on hiatus for nearly a decade, but would continue their run of quality with the Capcom vs SNK games, another ambitious tag team crossover series with a second entry also going on to become one of the apex titles of the 2D sprite based fighting game era in its own right. Aside from this though, not all was rosy regarding Capcom fighting titles. Street Fighter 3 and its iterations had been a commercial failure, Street Fighter EX 3 had been completely overshadowed and outsold by Tekken Tag Tournament, Capcom's 3D crossover game Capcom 5 All Stars was cancelled due to quality issues, and Capcom's sprite based fighting game Capcom Fighting Evolution sold poorly being panned by fans and critics alike. The golden age of Capcom fighting games seemed to be over. After years of fun on offer, Capcom fighting games had slowly lost their momentum. And for this reason, for a good while at least, the company chose to shy away from the genre, making the chances of a Marvel vs Capcom 3 happening increasingly less and less likely. Despite all this, thankfully a fighting game renaissance would eventually come for the company, which would interestingly start with Street Fighter 2, the very game that had previously led to an arcade renaissance in an era where the arcade was slowly dying. This source of popularity would arrive with the release of Street Fighter 2 on Xbox Live, leading to huge sales numbers as fans nostalgically clawed to play this all-time classic using their modern hardware. This would spark Capcom executive and so-called father of Mega Man, Inafune, to greenlight the development of Street Fighter 4, a modern game that was designed to lead the new generation of fighters while simultaneously cashing in on Street Fighter 2 nostalgia. This would be achieved by heavily leaning on the Street Fighter 2 cast in the latest game, and offering up very similar gameplay mechanics in an all new polygonal affair. In tandem with this, Capcom had also been offered to use Tatsunoko characters in one of their titles, intellectual properties belonging to a Japanese animation studio. This would lead to the Wii fighting game Tatsunoko vs Capcom, a new crossover fighting game that was developed simultaneously at the same time as Street Fighter 4. Street Fighter 4 and Tatsunoko vs Capcom were both commercial and critical successes which Capcom put partially down to their new game design choices. Both games featured more simplistic scaled back controls than most of the last sprite based fighting games the company created prior. Fighting game oversaturation paired with complicated competitive scene orientated mechanics had resulted in poor sales for Capcom fighting games, with them primarily only being appreciated by hardcore fighting game community members. Street Fighter 4 and Tatsunoko vs Capcom brought fighting games back to the mainstream, which would in turn mean many more Capcom fighting games would soon follow. During this new period of momentum, Capcom would finally acquire a new license to develop another game using Marvel characters, with this title being first publicly announced at Capcom's Captivate press show in Hawaii in April 2010. Rather excitingly, Ryota Nitsuma was tasked to head the project, the very same man who had found success when he ran the production of Tatsunoko vs Capcom. Nitsuma was ecstatic to lead a project that had seen years and years of unrelenting fan demand. When bringing this project to life, he would state that the game was to be built using an empty framework game engine, the same one used to create Resident Evil 4 and Lost Planet 2. The design philosophy for such a title would align much with the already successful Street Fighter 4 and Tatsunoko vs Capcom games. Essentially, both titles were designed to maximise gameplay depth and minimise complexity. Street Fighter 4 had expanded the Street Fighter user base, so Nitsuma felt that this line of thinking would result in growing the Marvel vs Capcom fanbase in much the same way. In fact, he argued that this was even more important with this game, as it was an excellent opportunity to draw in Marvel fans who were perhaps not familiar with fighting games. Marvel vs Capcom 3 arguably presented Capcom with one of their most significant opportunities yet, as this was a period after the Marvel brand had seen massive success in Hollywood. 
giving the game a level of marketing appeal not seen with any of the earlier Marvel vs Capcom games. Capcom's global head of production, Kiji Inafune, rubbed his hands together at the prospect of releasing a game that could appeal to such a broad audience. Things were shaping up great. The game's development would see the company opt for a simple control scheme similar to Tatsunoko vs Capcom, and add a simple mode which we shall discuss soon. In a first for the company, Capcom would also not bother to plan a release for this game in the arcades at all, and instead this time around attempt to appeal solely to the casual market gaming on PlayStation 3's and Xbox 360's at home. During the game's development cycle, Capcom's art design team would work extremely closely alongside Marvel comic employees to ensure that all characters in the game were properly artistically represented. This would mean that all the fighters featured in the game would be modelled after their most recent comic book appearances, leading to many characters looking quite different from their previous Capcom vs series outings. In terms of authenticity, this would also lead to Nitsuma getting rid of the Japanese voice actors for Marvel characters, as he felt that having those fighters speak a language other than English did not mesh well with those characters' images. The game, developed by Capcom in a collaborative effort with Aitin, would finally see release in February 2011, 11 years after the release of Marvel vs Capcom 2. This long-awaited game would see a simultaneous release on both the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, two consoles that seem perfect homes for the game. In terms of the game itself, the title massively differs artistically from the previous Marvel vs Capcom games. The title instead takes the same sort of graphical approach as Street Fighter 4 and Tatsunoko vs Capcom, in that the fights in the title take place on 2D planes, but the 2D sprites are dropped in favour of three-dimensional character models. Combat in the game, like in Marvel vs Capcom 2 of old, takes place between teams of three, taking on teams of three, meaning that after 11 long years, Teddy Long could breathe a sigh of relief as six-man tag team action lift to fight another day, players. Holla holla holla. In these tag team matches, players can switch between their three selected players at will and can call upon each of them during matches. Like in some previous MVC games, during the contests, players can also call on their off screen characters to perform single special moves known as assists, which adds to the game's in game strategy when experiencing this title. Further to this, as characters both receive and deal damage, their team's overall hyper combo gauge gradually fills up with energy, which can be used to execute various techniques. Like in many Capcom fighting games, this includes hyper combos. Like previous MVC games, once again, snapbacks are executable, forcing your opponent's character to tag out against their will. Crossover combination moves are also executable within this game, techniques which utilise the player's whole team to use all of their hyper combos simultaneously in one massive powerful attack. In addition to all of this, the game features an entirely new mechanic known as X Factors, which for a short time allows players to increase the damage they can inflict. They also have faster speed during this time frame and can regenerate health. A player can activate X Factors once per match and be used within extended combos. The power and endurance of an X Factor depend on how many fighters a team have left. The more damage the team has taken, the greater the move's power, making it somewhat of a desperation manoeuvre. Like the majority of fighting games, players must use the moves available at their disposal to deplete their opponent's life bars. In most circumstances, victory is achieved when all three members of an opposing team have been knocked out. However, in some cases, a winner is decided when the time limit runs out based on who has the most accumulative health remaining. Simple fighting game stuff really, as mentioned earlier in the video, to fall in line with Capcom's modern approach and to appeal to the vast casual market that the Hollywood film industry had generated for the Marvel Universe, the controls within Marvel vs Capcom 2 were scaled back more for Marvel vs Capcom 3. This was to try and give the game a broader appeal than simply fighting game community diehards. This simplification process has already been taking place anyway, with the earlier Marvel vs Capcom games such as X-Men vs Street Fighter offering a 6 button control scheme back in 1996, but by the time Marvel vs Capcom 2 came around, controls would be simplified down to a 4 button control scheme. Marvel vs Capcom 3, a further 11 years later, would go one step further, offering only a 3 button control scheme, much like Tatsunoko vs Capcom that had been released 2 years earlier. The 3 button scheme offered undefined light, medium and hard attacks, whereas in the earlier 6 button games, players had these options but could choose between 3 punches and 3 kicks. To quote Nitsuma on this more modern approach, he stated that this was to knock down the wall of complicated controls 
and open up a field of strategic fighting to all comers. Amusingly, if this simplified gameplay was not enough, Nitsuma would go one step even further with this one, introducing a simple mode which we briefly mentioned earlier. Simple mode was designed for gamers who had never played a fighting game and procured it due to their interest in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Simple mode is a style of play that allows players to perform special moves and hyper combos with just single button presses at the expense of limiting characters available moveset. Keeping all this in mind, if the developers made an effort to create an entire gameplay mode for gamers who did not care for fighting games, which changed the whole way the game played, it begs the question really, why have they never just stuck a 6 button hardcore mode in too? What is interesting I guess is that, that another 12 years on from this, with the release of Street Fighter 6, it seems Capcom have finally released the fighting game with both traditional classic controls and a simplified modern system as well. It only took decades, but it seems they got there. As mentioned earlier in the video, Marvel vs Capcom 2 offered 56 characters. On the other hand, the original version of Marvel vs Capcom 3 features a more slimmed down 36 characters. Speaking of this fighter lineup, as mentioned previously, Marvel gave Nitsuma's team direction when it came to the many character designs. However, all of the game balancing was left down to Capcom. So Nitsuma and Co's duty was to preserve the Marvel character's essence from the source material, while simultaneously shaping them as interesting in-game fighting characters. What may come as a surprise to some regarding the game's roster is that whilst Marvel vs Capcom 2 had that massive roster of 56 characters, only 14 of those would resurface as playable characters in the first iteration of Marvel vs Capcom 3, thus meaning the 22 other characters were entirely new to this fighting game franchise. Many of the roster members in Marvel vs Capcom 3, particularly on the Capcom side of things, are modern gaming characters, many of which did not even exist when X-Men vs Street Fighter was released back in 1996. Often in these videos, I run through every new addition, but considering this game has such an array of new characters, I'll just let the gameplay footage do most of the talking, with us touching on a few of my favourite additions here and there. One of them is Mayor Mike Hagger. I mean, come on, he has a sexy moustache for crying out loud. Whilst also appearing in Assassin's Creed Knights Landmasters before the release of this game, this was Hagger of Final Fight fame's first appearance as a playable fighter within a Capcom vs series game. A fighter whose appearance was long overdue in my opinion. Dante from Devil May Cry is also playable, a character who had grown to superstar status between the releases of this title and Marvel vs Capcom 2 back in the day. It would be criminal not to include him here. Other interesting additions would include Chris Redfield from Resident Evil and Beautiful Joe from Beautiful Joe, a character whose inclusion is perfect considering he is a superhero. Arthur of Ghosts and Goblins is also another fun addition to the roster, celebrating a classic series. There are many great inclusions for the Marvel side of things too, but the biggest of these debuts has to go to Deadpool. Deadpool by Marvel standards is a relatively new fighter, with today this fourth wall breaking character being right up there with Spider-Man as one of the most popular superheroes on the planet. His inclusion in this game was highly welcomed and probably the most memorable and iconic addition to the Marvel vs Capcom 3 roster. Building on this story, it is also of note that MVC3 was also the first Marvel vs Capcom title to offer DLC, expanding the roster to 38 characters introducing downloadable fighters Jill Valentine and Shuma Gorath. DLC costume packs also contain new outfits for Ryu, Thor, Dante, Iron Man, Chris Redfield and Captain America. In terms of play mode, MVC3 features an arcade mode that offers players exactly what they expect. It provides a series of matches against the various AI controlled teams of three, followed up with a final boss fight as is tradition. The final boss encounter of this game takes place against Galactus, a supervillain from the Fantastic Four comic book series. Beaten arcade mode of each player rewards the player with a different ending. There is also a local two player versus mode, a training mode and a mission mode which offers character specific challenges. Arguably most importantly, and in line with the modern era of gaming, the title featured online play, utilising Xbox Live and PlayStation Network services, essentially offering up endless multiplayer replayability for those who were that way inclined. So that's what Marvel vs Capcom 3 brought to the table, so what did journalists think? GameSpot would praise the title, stating there is a variable fighting series renowned for its structured insanity has finally returned with the same fire and intensity that was its hallmark. 
The game's core combat mechanics have been simplified and work harmoniously to drive you and the action forward. Marvel vs Capcom 3 is a blast to play despite losing some of the higher level intricacies found in its predecessor. It's an exceptional synthesis of cohesion and chaos and shows real improvement over its predecessor. IGN would add to the conversation by stating, This third entry in the MVC series attempts to be the same addicting game as its predecessor. The core mechanics for Marvel vs Capcom 3 are both fantastically familiar and alien. Ultimately, the alterations help mature the franchise, removing needless complexity. The game has enough depth as it is. The game isn't perfect, but it got the most important elements right, raising the question of quality versus quantity. Compared with Marvel vs Capcom 2, we've lost 20 characters. Does the balance and diversity of this group compensate for that loss? In some ways it does. There is something very refreshing about seeing unconventional and original fighting archetypes enter a franchise this established. Yes, it's undeniably disappointing that many favourites like Mega Man or Venom are nowhere to be seen. Marvel vs Capcom 3 doesn't disappoint as a fighting game even after a decade of waiting. It's very much the same insane concept we know and love, which isn't a bad thing. By drastically revising the roster, what's old is definitely new again. All in all, the game was universally praised, receiving multiple awards. At the Electronic Entertainment Expo, it would get the Best Fighting Game Award. It also earned the Best Fighting Games of the E3 Awards from IGN, 1UP.com and Xplay. From critic sources at the time, the only real criticisms seemed to rise from the game's lack of online play features, which did not offer the same depth as that of Street Fighter 4. Eurogamer pointed specifically to the absence of spectator mode, noting that excluding viewable matches also presented a severe shortcoming in the title. Overall though, journalists were very happy with the experience that Marvel vs Capcom 3 presented. But if you know anything about this game, you will know that Marvel vs Capcom 3 Fate of Two Worlds was not even this game's final form, as it was only a matter of time until we got a new iteration known as Ultimate Marvel vs Capcom 3. But how ultimate was this new version and why did it exist? Well apparently Capcom had planned to expand the original base game with the implementation of lots and lots of DLC, a feature that was not even possible during the days of Marvel vs Capcom 2. Development on DLC would take place throughout 2011. However, an event would shake the foundations of this process quite literally. Ultimately, to excuse the pun, resulting in most of the DLC being cancelled. The reason for this is because during the development of the game it would be interrupted by Japan being hit with a giant earthquake and tsunami, an undersea mega thrust off the coast of Japan that occurred on Friday March the 11th 2011. It was the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan and the fourth most powerful earthquake in the world since modern record keeping began in 1900. The chaos this event would inflict on the nation of Japan would massively disrupt the development cycle of the downloadable content. However, as is often the case, destruction births creativity, and as a result, the delayed additional content would be fleshed out further to create an additional standalone title that would retail at a discounted rate from that of the original. This new game, Ultimate Mob vs Capcom 3, would hit shelves at the tail end of 2011, and would obviously feature several changes to differentiate it from what came before. At the game's heart, the ultimate version of the game is still very much Marvel vs Capcom 3. The arcade fighting style remains largely the same as does the game's six person tag team mechanics, along with the characters assist special moves and hyper combos, but for people who have been fortunate enough to play both versions, they would have noticed some aesthetic changes. For example, characters and stage selection screens were completely redesigned. In fact, there are a lot of small changes in detail, some of which we shall cover. However, the game's most striking new feature was of course a largely expanded character roster, which is probably the main feature that would have inspired some consumers to repurchase Marvel vs Capcom 3 so quickly after the base version of the game saw release. Being a Marvel vs Capcom game, the title offered a balanced selection of new fighters coming from each entity, 6 from Marvel and 6 from Capcom, offering consumers a whopping 12 new characters to choose from. To put how many fighters this is into perspective, it's as many as what we got in Street Fighter 2 to begin with, so a very decent amount. Earlier in the video I mentioned that the character selection in Marvel vs Capcom 3 was probably not as strong as in the second entry, and once again, as is true for the rest of the game, these 12 fighters included a fair amount of obscure ones. 
who the average player wouldn't have necessarily been clamouring for. First, on the Capcom side of things, Strider Hariyu came back, a character from the older Marvel vs Capcom games who was not included in the earlier version of Marvel vs Capcom 3. While Ken from Street Fighter is not selectable, for some reasons players could now play as Phoenix Wright from Ace Attorney. I guess as nothing says hard bastard and fighting game character like a suit wearing rookie defense attorney. At least no one can accuse Capcom of being unimaginative with their roster. Virgil makes his debut in this game, but sadly this one is not the lonely assistant of the million dollar man Ted DiBiase. As great as it would have been to see the real Virgil in this game, this one is just Virgil from Devil May Cry. Building on the roster, Frank West from Dead Rising also made his MVC debut here after appearing in Tatsunoko vs Capcom earlier. Nemesis T-Type from Resident Evil 3 also makes their fighting game debut. And to round off the Capcom offerings, we got Firebrand, a character originally from the Ghosts and Goblins series who would receive their own spin-off series down the line known as Gargoyles Quest who, to be fair, at least is a more intimidating fighter than Arthur. On the Marvel side of things, we have Doctor Strange, who I was familiar with in my childhood due to watching the Fox Kid Spider-Man cartoon. Ghost Rider, who I suppose was topical at the time of the game's release, bearing in mind the character was portrayed in the movie that year by Nicolas Cage. Hawkeye, a member of the Avengers who had appeared in the Thor movie that year. Iron Fist, a user of martial arts and the wielder of a mystical force. Nova, a member of Intergalactic Police Force known as the Nova Corps, and Rocket Raccoon, who was an extremely prominent member in the 2008 relaunch of the superhero team Guardians of the Galaxy. Maybe it's me, being an older man, but even with the new additions to the Marvel vs Capcom 3 roster, I massively prefer the characters included in Marvel vs Capcom 2 to these. Closely looking at who was included for this one, it seems like many of the roster members were chosen for Marvel vs Capcom 3 for product placement purposes, to promote modern movies and games rather than trying to focus on characters with charm, actual lasting appeal and fighting game prowess. According to Seth Killian on the other hand, the former community manager at Capcom, he claimed the bizarre character offerings on the Capcom side of things were actually introduced to bring combat diversity to the game. For example, Capcom wanted a monster-like character that could fight in the air, so Firebrand was introduced. But the Marvel characters included would indeed correlate with my theory. Seth confirmed most of the new Marvel characters were chosen for the game to cross-promote upcoming products much like what I suspected in the first place, which is why I gather they lack a bit of soul. According to Capcom, many new features and refinements resulted from fan feedback from the Marvel vs Capcom 3 Fate of Two Worlds game, which would help them make the so-called Ultimate Edition stronger. In terms of these refinements, combat mechanics were tweaked. For example, combat was more balanced and the X-Factor mechanic was adjusted so that characters could use it whilst airborne rather than just on the ground. The game's aerial exchange feature was also tinkered with so that the player could remove the energy from their opponent's hyper combo gauge, energy to their own gauge, or deal more damage mixing things up slightly. In addition to the game's previous instalment, there were new play modes added to the ultimate version, including Heroes Herald, which was a free downloadable. This was a mode where players could earn new abilities, customize their characters with new powers, and compete in factions as either heroes defending Earth or as one of Galactus's heralds. New abilities were gained in this play mode by collecting what was known as ability cards, which featured various characters from the Marvel and Capcom universes. Up to three cards could be equipped with over 100 existing to collect. A new offline mode was also included known as Galactus mode, allowing players to fight as Galactus against AI controlled opponents, adding a little more variety to the experience. Ultimate Marvel vs Capcom 3 also provided smoother online play than that of Fate of Two Worlds, which was possible due to the second version of the game offering an optimised netcode. A spectator mode was also included to allow up to 6 players to watch online matches, and leadable functionality was also bolted onto the game. IGN will cover the release of this reiteration, commenting that the previous Marvel vs 3 game was a great fighter that pushed the series forward in many ways but drew criticism for a lack of modes and a smaller fighter roster than its predecessors. They also said Ultimate Marvel vs Capcom 3 makes all the customary moves for a Capcom update, bringing in new fighters, new stages and a few additional features while retaining the crazy sense of style that gives the series distinction in the fighting game genre. The new changes will be great for hardcore fans of the franchise. 
including the new characters, is a welcome addition that rectifies one of the main issues with Marvel vs. Capcom 3. But the game is still pretty light on new modes. Graphically, Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 has the same stylish look as regular Marvel vs. Capcom 3, which is great. What the characters lack in detail, they make up for in personality. Finally, they would add that the brightly coloured and intense special effects give the game a unique sense of style and a near seizure inducing visual pop and flair. The crazy characters and insane special combos and moves make Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 a visual treat that stands alone against other fighters out there. As you can see, IGN loved Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, but what did others think? GameSpot would state Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 introduces a host of unique characters and gameplay tweaks that change the game's formula for the better. They would be a little more critical than IGN though, summarising that, ultimately, Ultimate is still a monster hiding under an attractive coat of flashy combos and familiar characters. It may feel inviting at first, but sink a little deeper and you discover a game in which victory and defeat hinge on a fine line. It's a high risk, high reward system that buries you in a brightly coloured light show on the slightest misstep. Ultimate Marvel vs Capcom 3 is unquestionably the superior version and while its feature set still feels lacking compared to other available fighters, the series unique blend of structured insanity remains strong. Whilst the previous version of the game had appeared on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, Ultimate marked the first Marvel vs Capcom game in the franchise to be released on a handheld. A full console version of the game would arrive on the PlayStation Vita, which received heavy praise for its technical performance, visual fidelity and faithfulness to its home console counterparts. Sadly, after being on the market for less than two years, the game would be removed from online stores due to an apparent expiration on the Marvel contract Capcom held. It soon transpired that the key reason behind the event that had unfolded was that Marvel owners Walt Disney chose to stop Capcom from licensing the game rather than renewing it as originally intended. Disney's reasoning for this was that they wanted to optimise for Marvel IPs exclusively in their own games, their self-published Disney Infinity series, which to put it simply, was a kind of shameless rip-off of Skylanders. The same stunt that Nintendo was pulling off too when they released their Amiibo range. Like Nintendo, Disney could smell money here and Marvel figurines would make perfect little collectibles. But this did not pan out quite how they wanted, because as great as this plan was, the Infinity range would ultimately be a huge business blunder for Disney. Three years later, on March 10th, 2016, Disney would end their Infinity line citing a lack of growth in the toys to life market and increased developmental costs. They would even close down Avalanche Software and Disney Interactive Studios as a whole, showing that although they were a wealthy company, they were not good at self-publishing their own video game. Surprisingly and awesomely, this would result in Ultimate Marvel vs Capcom 3 being re-released digitally for the PlayStation 4 in 2016, followed by an Xbox One digital release in 2017 and some physical copies being manufactured for this next-gen hardware for a limited time. Now that Disney switched their business model, video game wise back to a licensing only model, this allowed them to license their characters back to Capcom once more, the company that had always done a fantastic job when it came to using Marvel characters. Meaning it would not be the end of the Marvel vs Capcom series just yet. Taking all of the game's predecessors out of the equation, Marvel vs Capcom 3 is a game that was perfect for its time period it was born into, and as a result it would end up selling 2 million freaking copies to fans around the globe. It is still up for debate whether Marvel vs Capcom 3 delivered a superior sequel to that of Marvel vs Capcom 2, and many old school fans of the franchise would undoubtedly disagree. One fact however cannot be argued with. Capcom produced something significantly different from the last entry in the series and a game that overall did a fantastic job creating a title that not only appealed to the casual gaming market, but one that is still being played heavily by passionate fans to this very day. The game is currently even still available to buy on Steam and can be played at 1080p and at 60 frames per second. This just leaves us with one more Marvel vs Capcom game to revisit, the controversial Marvel vs Capcom Infinite. The new project was to be directed by Norio Hiroshi, a man who worked as a programmer of the series since X-Men vs Street Fighter back in 1996. 
Development of the title was split between several different parties, with Capcom of Japan, Capcom USA and Marvel Games themselves all playing an active role. The concept which they intended to deliver on was to create a game which was both complex and hardcore like traditional fighting games of old, but to also be a game that was more elegant and simplified than many created in the past. As usual, like with most modern fighters, attempting to appeal to as wide a market as possible. I have noted in the past how games such as Street Fighter 4 and Marvel vs Capcom 3 were already much more simplistic than games that had come before them, with the entries in the Street Fighter 3 series being prime examples of more complex fighters that had commercially failed. These sort of games did not sell well on release due to not appealing strong enough to the casual market, a problem that Capcom rectified with their later titles with their more simplified experiences. These games sold very well so it is no surprise really that Capcom intended to double down even further on simplicity. Perhaps even more excitingly for Capcom, to Disney's credit, the Marvel brand was only getting bigger and bigger. There was now an even larger casual market for Marvel characters than there was in the past, as the success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe had put the brand in an entire different stratosphere, to its place in the world from where it was back in 1996 with the release of X-Men vs Street Fighter. Superheroes were mainstream and in many ways legitimately cool. Now there is a lot to get through with regards to what Capcom and Co did to attempt to make something that was even more simplistic than the likes of Marvel vs Capcom 3. So let's go through the many elements that make up this final instalment in the series. Capcom analysed that many people who had played the last entry in the series viewed the game as way too overwhelming with just far too much going on. For this reason, to attempt to make Infinite more accessible to everyone, the series famed 3-on-3 three -three battle system would be completely phased out and replaced with more simplistic 2-on-2 -two -two battles, a move that many gamers would instantly see as a massive step backwards for the series. As you can imagine, the axing of the 6-man tag action was hugely disappointing to many fans of the series. Previously, the game had always been championed for including more and more elements, and the 3 on 3 tag in tag out battles were one of the key features as to why Marvel vs Capcom 2 was so loved in the first place. Further to this, the previous game's chaotic nature was a staple of the series that set it apart from other games in the same genre, so this move not only seemed to be diluting the franchise to bring it more in line with other fighters, but customers would also feel cheated having elements removed from a game rather than being added. How irritating. Speaking of removing things, the reduction of fighters in each match was not the only feature that would be removed from combat, as to quote Capcom, things would be streamlined further. A previous well-known inclusion in the series was the ability to call in other characters to perform assist moves. Such a mechanic was completely taken out of the game and instead replaced with a new feature involving the Infinity Stones. The six Infinity Stones can be loosely compared to the grooves in the Capcom vs SNK games, offering players slightly different fighting game mechanics. Although, rather than being placed in the game to present players with further customization, it seems as though they were mainly featured in order to further level up the playing field in matches, arguably assisting in damaging the competitive nature of the game and instead opening up more possibilities for less skilled players to win matches. The Infinity Stone's main purpose functions as a comeback enabler, compensating for losing characters' deficiencies by enhancing their strong points. As we know, there are a lot of marketing reasons why the name Infinite was used for the title, but obviously the Infinity Stones themselves further tie into this theme, with one developer stating the goal was for the stones to present players with infinite gameplay possibilities. Fortunately, like previous entries, the Hyper Combo Gauge is featured within this game and gradually fills up as characters deal and receive damage. Filling this up allows players to perform traditional hyper combos, but now a move called a counter switch is also executable. Counter switches lets characters tag out instantly, even whilst an opponent is attacking them, allowing combos to be broken more simply than previously by allowing for easy counter attack opportunities. Something that may come as a surprise considering that Disney and Capcom were looking to simplify everything, Capcom chose to return to the old 4 attack button layout which had not been seen since much earlier entries in the series. I guess this must have been one of the features included, what Capcom were referring to, when they said right at the beginning they were intending to include some aspects in the game that made it closer to Marvel vs Capcom games of old. 
To be fair, this does not particularly damage the game's accessibility, which seems to be the main angle Capcom really wanted to push, due to the fact that combos in this one are performable simply by tapping the light punch button both on the ground and in the air, meaning in theory even a 3 year old could perform combos in this game. Even hyper combos were made executable by just pressing the two heavy attack buttons at once. The removal of specific joystick and button combinations removed a layer of skill from the game, again something that not many long term fans of the series were particularly happy about. So that's the basic mechanical changes to the game, but as you know there were more factors that made Marvel vs Capcom so popular in the past that were down to more than simply just the combat system. So despite the fighting mechanics themselves debatably being gimped, does this game at least bring a charming innovative roster to the table? Well, let's discuss. In the past it seems each entry seemed to bring some kind of cool gimmick to the roster. The first game lets us play as both the X-Men and the Street Fighter characters. The second game gave us other Marvel fighters to play as. The next one gave us new characters on the Capcom side of things. The fourth entry gave us a gigantic roster. And the fifth game ended up giving us a large roster too. This time made up with plenty of completely new fighters. They all brought us something unique. So did Marvel vs Capcom Infinite provide us with an infinite amount of fighters to choose from? Well obviously, absolutely not. Marvel vs Capcom 2 gave us 56 fighters, Ultimate Marvel vs Capcom 3 gave us 48, whereas Marvel vs Capcom Infinite shortchanged gamers by giving us a launch lineup roster selection of only 30 different characters, which was a huge step backwards. But I guess at least it falls in line with Capcom's aim at the time to simplify things. So I guess reducing players choices seems to have been one of their methods in achieving this feat. This would be more acceptable if we got 30 great characters, but what we actually got was very disappointing. Out of the 30 characters who were chosen for the game, only 5 of those were new to the franchise, with the rest returning from previous games. On the Capcom side of things we received X as a playable fighter, the lead character from the Mega Man X series, and Jedha the final boss from Dark Souls 3. In terms of Marvel characters, the newbies would include Gamora from Guardians of the Galaxy, along with Ultron from the Avengers series and Captain Marvel. Apart from wanting to simplify things, I personally feel that Capcom intentionally limited the lineup in order to encourage players to fork out even more money for the game's DLC characters. Six characters who should have been in the game in my opinion from day one anyway. Marvel vs Capcom is about huge rosters and chaotic nonsense, so they shouldn't have been changing this now. In regards to the DLC, Black Panther, Black Widow, The Winter Soldier, Sigma, Monster Hunter and Venom could all be downloaded. But Venom was a character who was free in all of the previous games in the series, which made this all the more frustrating. Apart from making gamers have to pay an additional fee to add fighters to the game's bare bones lineup, an element that made all of this even more annoying is that many beloved fighters from the series were left out altogether. Most notably, the majority of characters from the Street Fighter franchise, and even more alarmingly, the game features not even one single character from the X-Men. The Marvel franchise that was the key focus of the crossover series over the entire 20 years prior. Reportedly, when it comes to the game's character roster, in terms of the characters featured in this, it is said that Marvel Studios called many of the shots, prioritising characters based on how important they were to their stupid cinematic universe they were heavily marketing at the time, rather than including superheroes with established lasting appeal. Basically, characters were chosen by Disney for product placement purposes, rather than trying to deliver the most likeable roster possible. You know, fighters fans of a series actually wanted. Many found it absolutely despicable that there were no X-Men to be found in the game, particularly bearing in mind the success of these crossover games had been built around them and many wanted to see their favourites return. So what on earth was going on that would result in perhaps the best Marvel vs Capcom characters being shelved altogether? Well Disney greed of course. In terms of movie licensing, despite Disney owning Marvel Studios, in 2016 Fox held the movie rights to the X-Men franchise. From what I can tell there was absolutely no reason that the entire X-Men lineup had to be left out of the game other than the fact that Disney actively chose to discard them as they couldn't be used to promote one of their own movies. 
Having no X-Men present instantly stopped this title feeling congruent with the rest of the series. Hilariously, Capcom producer Peter Rosas, aka Combo Fiend, attempted to justify this greedy corporate nonsense by making up an excuse for the X-Men being missing from the game, stating, We talked with Marvel very closely about their future roadmap, about what's going to be happening. You're a modern Marvel fan, maybe they don't even remember some of the X-Men characters, but they know some of the Guardian characters, or Black Panther, you know what I mean. Captain Marvel may seem like a strange pick, but she's fantastic. She fits the gameplay, she fits the story, and they're going to be really pushing for her as a strong female lead all the way up into the movie. We're trying to take everything into account and choose the best characters. So yeah, according to one of the most important people who worked on this project, people apparently didn't know who the X-Men were anymore and gamers would all soon be worshipping Disney's depiction of Captain Marvel instead. Speaking of which, comment below who do you prefer? Capcom's depiction of the X-Men or Disney's Captain Marvel? I'd be eager to hear your thoughts. Amusingly, Rosas doubled down on his opinion by trying to claim X-Men characters in previous Marvel vs Capcom entries had only ever been popular due to their function, rather than, you know, most casual players just enjoying iconic character design. To be exact, he would state, if you were to actually think about it, these characters are just functions. They're just doing things. Magneto, case in point, is a favourite because he has an 8-way dash and he's really fast, right? So our most technical players, all they want is to do triangle jump and that kind of stuff. Well, guess what? Nova can do the same thing. Captain Marvel can do the same thing. Ultron can do the same thing. Go ahead and try them out. Now, Peter, Peter, Peter. Believe it or not, people enjoy playing fighting games for reasons other than becoming absolute combo fiends. The tournament scene and competitive play is a small part of things for most of the market, with the majority just wanting to be able to play the game with their favourite fighters, especially a game full of Marvel fighters. All in all, I have to say, I find Rosa's gymnastics quite hilarious, especially with regards to him trying to justify as to why there were no X-Men included in the game. I understand that it would probably not be a good look for him or Capcom admitting that the X-Men were left out simply because Disney didn't have an X-Men movie coming out, but trying to claim they are not popular and no one really wants to play as them was just plain ridiculous. What a sad state of affairs. So thus far discussing this car crash of a game, we have established that we have scaled back fighting mechanics a puny roster, missing some of the most popular Marvel characters of all time, but maybe the play mode saved this. So let's see what the game offered in that department. Around the time frame the game was released, Capcom were not strangers to criticism and have made blunders with their fighting games prior to this one. Street Fighter V, for example, came under harsh criticism due to the amount of content available in the game being quite frankly abhorrent on release and server issues delivered a poor online multiplayer experience in the early days too. Holding these thoughts, Capcom were looking to at least deliver better on features like this with Marvel vs Capcom Infinite, so that they could right some of their previous wrongs. This would mean that Infinite would feature many standard fighting game play modes, something that somehow Street Fighter V had managed to lack. But on top of all of that too, the game would feature an all new play mode, set to heavily target that huge diverse audience and casual players who are enjoying the now huge Marvel Cinematic Universe. In fact, with regards to touching on this, something I have not at all mentioned yet, which you would have at least noticed plenty of times in this video, is the game's new cinematic graphical style. This differed from the previous entry in the series, Marvel vs Capcom 3, which featured characters who looked like they were 3D models based on how characters were drawn in Marvel comic books. This game features a more realistic look to fall further in line with Disney's money-spinning movies. Capcom are really hoping to hook into the market who love these films, which is where a new play mode comes in, known as Infinite Story Mode. This is a two-hour cinematic story campaign featuring story cutscenes and dialogue. The cheesy story ties all of the characters from the game into one cohesive narrative, which kind of reminds me of the subspace emissary that was featured in Super Smash Bros. Brawl a decade prior. The story delivers cringe-worthy one-liners delivered almost entirely without charm, but at least it is something new for the franchise, if we are going to draw any positives here. Reading various reviews that were published around this game's release, review scores seem to be average, with a mix of praise and criticism being presented. Many journalists were disappointed though, due to many of the faults we've already gone over, 
Some elements did go down very well though, such as the Infinity Stone system, which IGN noted was a highlight of the game for them. Speaking of IGN, they were disgusted with the game's story and roster though, stating its story is dreadful and its characters look like they were deliberately designed to spawn a million derpy memes. As discussed previously, the goal for Capcom with this one was to create a game with simplified play mechanics that would appeal to the gigantic market who watch Marvel movies. Capcom were unfortunately not capable of pulling this feat off, as the game would massively underperform commercially, even putting off many members of the already established Marvel vs Capcom fanbase. Capcom were extremely confident that this game would shift a bare minimum of 2 million units, with the hope of selling much much more if they got things right. The game never even got close to its sales target though, only selling around 1 million copies, and when you consider the popularity of the MCU, that's a bit embarrassing really. Within Capcom's 2018 integrated report, Capcom described sales for Infinite as weak, stating Marvel vs Capcom Infinite delivered a certain level of sales, primarily overseas owing to deep-rooted popularity but underperformed overall. Considering the commercial failings of this game, I see it as highly unlikely that there will be another Marvel vs Capcom game ever again. But which part is most to blame with regards to all of this? Can we credit Disney with being the entity who destroyed this franchise? Well, personally, I would blame equally both parties, as they both failed to deliver an experience worthy of the Marvel vs Capcom crossover brand. Disney should certainly be held accountable for depriving long-term fans of the ability to play as the X-Men. The X-Men, along with the cast of Street Fighter, are the very reason this crossover formula started, so to exclude them from the game is frankly ridiculous, even if Disney were not releasing any movies featuring the X-Men at the time. Blatant corporate greed has never been more transparent than it is when looking at the Marvel vs Capcom Infinity roster. Speaking of greed, it is greed that seems to be the running theme that looks to have destroyed any chances of this game becoming an all-time great. Capcom intentionally nuked most of the intricacies, six-man action and chaos that made this franchise so popular in the first place. They threw away most of what fans enjoyed and were familiar with, simply to try and cater to a larger market who would ultimately ignore that this game exists anyway. Their greed would mean that they would satisfy no one. Disney certainly contributed to destroying Marvel vs Capcom, but Capcom seemed to play their equal role in the affair too. Despite the death of a once great franchise, all is not lost as we still have all the great games from the series to go back and play. Games from a time period when Capcom were making games to simply deliver the best experiences possible rather than trying to appeal to markets that simply were not there or trying to fleece the consumers through microtransactions. If you enjoyed this video and want more content like this, subscribe now, then why not check out my video on the worst Street Fighter protagonist ever. Yeah, cheerio.